Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kate Semino, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Citizens League, and really glad to have you here today. Thanks for making the time. We are looking forward to a really great program, and I do want to say a few things as we get started today. Thank you again for joining, and I really want to thank Comcast for their support of this Mind Opener event and for their years of partnership with the Citizens League. Comcast has been great partners with the League and really present in community. We are just really loving seeing Comcast work right now. Um, right now, one of the initiatives that has really stood out to me that Comcast is leading is called Comcast Rise. And you can find out more about it at ComcastRise.com. They have an initiative supporting small businesses, particularly owned by people of color that have been really impacted in this past year disproportionately. And Comcast has stepped in to say, uh, we support these small businesses and these business owners and leaders. So please check that out, find out more about what Comcast is up to. And thank you again, Comcast, for your support of this series, of, of this event. We are glad to have you with us today and glad that you uh, decided to join, made the time, came to join us today. And we want to especially thank those of you who made a contribution to the Citizens League at that point of registration. That means a lot. So you are truly helping make this event and this series possible. Thanks again. I'll say a little more about the Citizens League. I think many of you are familiar already, but the Citizens League is here to help the people of Minnesota engage in issues that are important to them and important to their communities. Mm -hmm. To learn about policy topics, which is what we're doing today, and to activate your voice to help create solutions in your community and in our state. We call this public policy making. And we call it civic leadership. And we believe that the more people get involved in this work, the better. The better the outcomes, the better the results. The Citizens League is a nonprofit organization. We're based in St. Paul and we work statewide. And we're nonpartisan, or we like to say multipartisan. We engage with people from all different political ideologies and perspectives. And that really is part of our mission, is bringing together and exploring different perspectives. That does include rural and metro, small town, big city perspectives as well. At the Citizens League, we also acknowledge that there is a historical context to all policies that we experience today in our lives and that we can talk about and look at. Uh, they didn't just appear out of nowhere. They were created in a historical context and realities. And that's part of what today's program is going to go into a bit more. And I think it's a really good example of why history matters and why historical context matters when we look at policies and impacts of policies today. So we invite you, if you want to take a stand to include more people in policy making, to activate more people to make a difference in their communities, then I invite you to support the Citizens League because we can't do this without you. And you are invited to consider a donation at citizensleague.org slash donate. And now it is my pleasure to hand the mic virtually to our host and producer, Tom Weber. Welcome, Tom. Thank you so much, Kate. It's so great to be here. Uh, you mentioned the historical context, which is very important to today's conversation. You know, when we talk about public policy, especially with uh, efforts here by the Citizens League, we're always often talking about current times. What is the policy right now to talk about? And what we're going to do today is absolutely talk about today times, but a lot of history in this particular event. Um, there's a long history of what we're discussing today, racial housing covenants. And these covenants have a lot of ramifications today. That's why we're talking about them. They were one of many longstanding practices that kept families of color out of specific parts of a city. And that very much happened in Minneapolis throughout Hennepin County. And we know that because of a unique project at the University of Minnesota called Mapping Prejudice. If um, I'm going to give away the ending of this story a little bit, the covenants we're actually going to talk about are no longer enforceable. But we are going to hear all of the ways they still very much matter today. And for the public, and for the public policy people and the wonks in the audience, there is a lot of policy that could be part of conversation for years because of this. So I hope you will uh, be part of that and join. And if you have a question 
for our guests during this conversation, please at the bottom of your screen, use the Q&A function. We would prefer that over the chat. I know you're used to doing chat on Zoom, but please use that Q&A function to submit your questions. Kirsten Delegard is one of the co-founders of Mapping Prejudice and is our guest for this hour. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, it is my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, let's just start off with that very basic first question. What is a covenant, a racial covenant? Mm -hmm. So a racial covenant, they are clauses that were inserted into property deeds uh, that um, made, uh, you know, that determined that made a certain parcel of land off limits to anyone who is not white. So it's a lot of different kinds of language um, that were written into these racial covenants, everything from um, this, this uh, land, this parcel can never be occupied from someone by someone who's not of the Caucasian race. Sometimes it will say, give a long laundry list of people who um, can't um, live um, on this piece of land. Um, people of Mongolian descent, Turkish descent, um, African descent, Hebrew descent. Um, so, so we we have found um, in Hennepin County, where we when, where our database is the most complete, we have found twenty five thousand um, racial covenants, um, and uh, of those twenty five thousand, there are hundreds of variations in terms of the language um, that was used to make that land um, reserve that land for people who are white. So, what why do this? What, what is, how did these come about? Because as I understand it, when Minneapolis started in the 1870s, they weren't, these weren't necessarily a thing at that time. Yeah. So, yeah. So, the, so racial covenants have been around uh, since the 19th century, but they were not, um, not in Minnesota and they weren't common um, in most parts of the country until the late 19th century. And here in the Twin Cities, the first racial covenant that we found was from 1910. Um, so, so before that, they're, they're not in use. Um, so racial covenants came, um, they, they developed hand in glove with um, uh, developments in urban planning, um, thoughts around urban planning, um, thoughts around uh, city reform at, in the early 20th century, um, and also the professionalization of the real estate industry. So all those th things added to um, you know, made racial covenants, uh, uh, well, promote, you know, gave steam to racial covenants. Um, so, yeah, so yeah. They, 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 and they were, the reason that um, they were seen as necessary, these tools were seen as necessary, is that there was, um, there was this a new thinking around American cities in the early 20th century. American cities were not very um, healthy or very pleasant places to live. Um, and so as people were trying to think about what do we need to do to make American cities um, better places to, to live and specifically to the, to the point of this event today to make better citizens who will be better at participating in civic life. Um, all, kinds of, all kinds of things came out of that. Um, things like more park space, um, municipal garbage collection, uh, you know, separating in industry from residential areas and also separating people by race. The idea was that in order to have a healthy um, stable um, community uh, where property values would continue to increase, people had to be living, people of different races had to be kept separate. And so racial covenants were one of the tools um, that became very popular to, to realize this end. Um, and it's important to know that in Minneapolis, in the early part of the 20th century, Minneapolis was not particularly segregated. Um, so, and, and of course, the way people think about race over time changes a lot. Um, in the sense that people didn't necessarily think of Minneapolis as a so-called white city because we had such a huge percentage of people who were born in other countries at the early part in the early part of the 20th century. And a lot of those people weren't necessarily regarded as white. But you also had this is the post-Civil War time. Yeah. And really Minnesota, Minneapolis, this was a very um, abolitionist, uh, you know, at the highest level of the state. This was um, a very, you know, first to send the troops to the Union cause and all of that. So that would that would lead then to the idea or thought, probably potentially mistaken, that then we were on the right side of history when it then came, you know, if we're talking about a civil war fought over slavery and the enslavement of Black people, um, are we then on the right side of history these 50 years later? 
I wish I wish that that it were that simple, and I wish it were that that, that were the case. But of course, um, we know that people who were opposed to slavery were not necessarily in favor of racial equity. Um, they, and and um, in no place is this more obvious in Minnesota than the treatment of Native Americans. You know, because of course the period after the Civil War is the period um, where you have the um, the expulsion of the Dakota people in particular, um, the passage of, of laws that made it illegal to live in Minnesota if you were Dakota. Um, so, so, it's, it's, so it's not just because people were in favor of the union and because they were in favor of abolition didn't mean that they were in favor of a multiracial society. So you mentioned at the start of this that a covenant actually is just a clause. If you sell a house, you get this big deed, yep. pages and pages, mm -hmm. you got to go looking for it. And we'll talk about yeah. that, about the work yeah. you did to go find it. Why is it there? You just mentioned that the federal government passed a law saying that Dakota people couldn't live in Minnesota. Why not if Minneapolis is so, you know, heck bent on uh, separating the races, why can't Minneapolis as a city or the Minnesota as a state pass a law that say Black people can only live here or can't live there? Well, they didn't need to. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's, I mean, I think that's the, the sad truth. Like there are states like Oregon that put it in their constitution that only people who are white could live in Oregon. Um, so Minnesota did not do that. Um, but of course, Minnesota had this law that made it um, that made it illegal to live in Minnesota if you were Dakota after the U.S. Dakota War, um, and um, Minnesota, you know, in the in the immediate af aftermath of the Civil War, was overwhelmingly, you know, once Native Americans were pushed out, it became, um, you know, a lot of European settlers um, moved in, um, and and I and I think that it was it was it was the state was imagined as an overwhelmingly white place. Um, and so it was more, um, I would say, racial covenants were introduced, not because there was a, so let me back up here. The story of racial covenants has traditionally been told as, um, as, a, as a reaction to um, the great migration from the South. The, from the, and the, so that's the story that's been told about racial covenants, especially in Chicago, because Chicago has been seen as sort of the place where racial covenants you know, took root and were most prevalent. Um, and it, it, it's been sort of told as this regrettable but understandable reaction to this great influx of people who, you know, who are new to the community. Um, so what Minneapolis shows us, what the Twin Cities show us is, is that was not the case in the sense that it's a tiny percentage of people who are not white um, in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, in St. Paul in 1910, and that these there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of these racial covenants that are put into place well before people who are not white have moved to, this, to the Twin Cities in large numbers. So it was an attempt to um, sort of preserve this, the racial makeup that people imagined, I think, after, after the Civil War in Minnesota, when Minnesota was becoming a state, trying to keep that, you know, kind of lock that into place. So you get this legal document that says this property shall start at this latitude and longitude. It shall yeah. be on this street, et cetera. You know, and then somewhere in the middle, here's one example that the said land or buildings thereon shall never be rented, leased or sold, transferred or conveyed to, nor shall same be occupied exclusively by person or persons other than of the Caucasian race. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, that's one of the more timid ones in terms of using descriptors, uh, words that we don't use uh, really in polite society anymore to describe people. You would be amazed what some of the words are that are in some of these deeds. I actually looked it up. My my house doesn't have it, what, but the house next door does. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, and this gets into a little bit of how you then found this work, yeah. If I look it up on your on your website, does it automatically mean that my house didn't have a covenant, or is it possible that maybe it did and those records mm -hmm. are just lost somewhere? Well, I you know our map is pretty darn good, um, so <laughs> very good. Um, yeah, but it's not perfect. It's not one hundred percent because that's impossible. So 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 why don't I back up and sort of explain how we how we did yeah, the work please. and why. Yeah. Um, 
you know, why it was really a methodological breakthrough in terms of understanding where, how many racial covenants we had in our, in our built landscape and, and where they were. Um, so if any of you have had the good, the pleasure of working in property records, um, you know, which I hadn't before I started this project. And I want to give a shout out to Penny Peterson, my, one of the co-founders of the Mapping Prejudice Project, who was the one who has taught me everything I know about, about property records. Um, so, uh, so property records are arranged um, chronologically rather than geographically. So if you want to go find your, so, that, so that's how the mass of, of property records are, are organized. And if you want to go find out about your particular property, you have to use a set of interlocking indexes um, you know, down at the, on the fifth floor of the government center with the very nice people in the recorder's office in Hennepin County um, who can guide you through this. But it's, it's super complicated. And, and basically your property will appear in that record every time it changes hands. You know, so maybe it changes hands twice, three times over a century, or maybe it changes hands 12 or 15 times, you know? And you have to, in order to locate, to see whether you have a racial covenant, you have to check each one of those transactions and see whether a racial covenant was inserted at any one of those moments. You don't know how many times it changed hands. Um, so there's nothing simple. There's nothing, you can't be like, okay, I'm gonna look at, I think there's probably some racial covenants on this block. I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna pull one sheet of records or something and just tick down the list and see what has racial covenants. That's not the way it works. So instead you you have to look through all, you know, through all the dates and see, if there are any yeah. racial covenants um, uh, sort of recorded. So, um, so, when I, so when we first started this work, um, I had heard all these stories about racial covenants. People had told me about racial covenants. Um, and, but I kept saying to people as a historian, I kept saying, you know, I'd really like to see one of these documents. I'd like to see what they say. I'd like to see where they are. And most of the people before I met Penny Peterson said, I can't do that. <laughs> I don't have a copy. I can't show you the document. And it was only when I got to Penny where she said, oh, sure, I can get you hundreds of racial covenants. And um, you know, she went down to the recorder's office and she started looking through all these indexes and locating all these racial covenants, thousands of them. Um, and when she finished that work after six months, um, she had amassed um, the, what was the largest data set of racial covenants ever created for an American city. It was like 1,200 racial covenants. No one had ever done that work before because it was so laborious and took so much skill. Um, so, so that was the you know so that was the first time that we could really get even a sense of like a pattern of these racial restrictions in Minneapolis. Um, and, and that was basically, you know, Penny was incredible, but this was sort of like what other people had done for other, other American cities before, although her data set was three times larger than any others that had ever been created. Um, and, and so what we did from that is um, her completion of that work coincided with um, Hennepin County had just digitized its property records. Um, and so we could use this, what Penny did, this proof of concept, and then apply it to these newly digitized property records and use all these digital tools to um, sort of cut out a lot of that work that she had done and just um, scan through these 10 million property images or images of property records from Hennepin County and get the computer to do that work of looking to ping where this kind of racist language was. Um, so, and then we took that big batch, the computer took those 10 million images, narrowed it down to 30,000 property records that seemed to have this language. Then we had volunteers use a digital platform and confirm whether or not there was this, a racial covenant um, and, and give us the information about where it was, the legal language. Um, and so, and that, and that is, all that work has culminated in the map that you can find on our website. Uh, but what that map doesn't show right. is if, is if, for instance, you had a handwritten property deed. Um, so the, our methodology does not work for the handwritten property records. There's, we we firmly believe like your property in 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 your you know on your house probably probably doesn't have a racial covenant if it if it showed up as not having one on our map because you're in a suburb and it was developed a little later. 
Um, but if you're in the city, for instance, and your property was developed and at a time where people were still handwriting deeds, um, it could have, you know, if you see a lot yeah. of racial covenants around your house, chances are we just missed yours. Um, so, so it's important to look at the patterns, I guess, in terms of assessing like whether well, or not you have a racial restriction or not. So I hope that, you know, as we talk about what we will be talking about is the public policy that comes from this, you know, the, the, I hope that people who are, are watching this really can, can appreciate the extent to what kind of, you know, just day after day after day kind of work it takes to even get what really looks like a very nicely presented map on a website. And you mentioned, for example, every time you change over, that's why, you know, in 1910, we see our first covenant. Mm -hmm. You had properties before that that didn't have these covenants. And then whenever they switched hands, whenever they were sold in 1912, 1920, then they were inserted. This was an active act mm -hmm. to then add them to these contracts. Yeah, there's relatively fewer of that, you know, in the sense of Minneapolis mm -hmm. is a little bit more unusual in the sense that pro what property developers realized early on is that the covenants were only really effective if they did the whole neighborhood at the same time. You know, like it didn't, it was kind of, so, so they tended to blanket them on a whole, like on a whole couple blocks, a whole development, a whole subdivision. Um, yeah, but it is, it's this active, we have this very integrated city in 1910. You have a lot of people who start agitating, taking to the streets, frankly, writing letters to the editor. Um, lobbying the city council, lobbying the real estate board um, to demand a, 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 to demand segregation in Minneapolis. It's you not have, something that just happens, yeah. you know, by accident. Well, and the Mapping Prejudice website also notes these maps where, to your point, the black population, for example, in a, 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 frankly a, a nicer part of town in Minneapolis, Southwest Minneapolis, there were a few dozen people uh, oh, yeah. who were black, who yeah. lived there in 1910, but then by 1940, it's down to zero. Yes, right. Yeah, I mean, one of the most, there's a lot of, you know, each one of these stories yeah. of these families is so, um, frankly, you know, very, very moving to me and very, um, it's not, it's not shocking. It's just very, very illuminating, right? How that, how this happens. But one of the more dramatic I think um, examples of this is um, a family, uh, the Scott family owned the land that is now 50th in France, a black family. Wow. Um, and they very clearly were working, they were, it was a black, a black couple with a, with a little girl named Evelyn. And they, um, when they platted, they, they had this, this land and they platted it into a neighborhood and they called it Evelyn's addition after their daughter. And um, that land, um, through the Great Depression, Depression um, uh, John Scott died um, at the beginning of the Great Depression. His widow could not hold on to the land. She lost it for taxes during the Depression. And as soon as she lost it, um, someone came along and hand wrote in this racial covenant, racial covenants on that. So it went from being explicitly black, you know, a black development with a little girl's name on it to being an exclusively white subdivision in Edina. So that leads to one of the questions we have on our from our audience. And by the way, go to the Q&A part of, at the bottom of the screen if you have any. Given that racial covenants blocked black people from acquiring real property and therefore opportunities to save and pass on wealth mm -hmm. to the next generation, yeah. how can one quantify the lost wealth and income for those people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we are working with some economists who are trying to do exactly that. It is not my forte, um, but uh, so what their initial research has shown, um, Araja Sood and Will Spiegel and my colleague, Kevin Erman Solberg, who's been providing the, the GIS data for this, is that um, in Minneapolis, um, any house that had a racial covenant on it um, at any point today, today, 50 years after the Fair Housing Act was you know, past is now worth 15% more than the identical house that ne never had a racial covenant. So I always use the example of my own family. 
um, that my one of my grandparents' houses had a racial covenant. The other one was in a neighborhood that was surround or on a block that was actually surrounded by houses that had racial covenants, and that my grandparents were able to um, pass that additional wealth on on to me, which is um, what made it possible for me to buy the house that I'm sitting in today. You know, so yes, so that's so it's fifteen percent. We we use that fifteen percent number just in sort of the direct wealth. What is that? What is that? Um, if you take all that wealth and you know, put it all in the same pot, what does that add up to? Yeah. Yeah. So we also have heard about redlining, right? Where, and and at the nuts and bolts of it, a lot of times it had to do with whether you could get your house insured, and the red line had to do with whether the banks, you know, would get in on that um, insurance. But it really basically meant that's where black and brown people lived, um, and, and frankly, for a time, Jewish people as well. Mm -hmm. um, is redlining? How does redlining relate to racial covenants? Okay, that's I love this question because because uh, this is probably I would say the biggest um, point of confusion for people, or you know that um, if you if you don't know anything, you know if you're new to this subject, which I was when I started this work, um, people people say to me all the time, "I love your redlining project," and I'm like, "Well, you know, because redlining has become the shorthand, right, for all right. these." This constellation, I always say, it's not just covenants; it's the whole, it's the whole package, right? So, I'm going to tell a story because I'm a historian, narrative historian, and that's my easiest, um, you know, vehicle, right, for explaining this. Um, so, you have a city, you have Minneapolis in 1910, pretty integrated city. You have covenants introduced in 1910. You start to see this reshuffling by race because of these covenants. Um, so, some of it is that it's new neighborhoods coming online are, are restricted to people who are who are only, you know, only to white people, but it's also this normalization of these ideas that people have to be separated by race, that um, that people who are not white living in a neighborhood is is dangerous and unstable in some ways. And so you have so it, you see how covenants actually supercharge white mob violence in the same period. And, and you see mobs of people neighbors organizing to drive people out of different neighborhoods in South Minneapolis. So all this is all intertwined, right? But the result is that by the 1930s, by the, by the mid 1930s, um, the city has been really reorganized and you have a couple, you have a couple of neighborhoods that are um, majority not white for the first time. So you have the old South side um, in, in South Minneapolis, you have the near North side in North Minneapolis, you have um, what we now call Cedar Riverside, um, and then you have the area near Hiawatha. Um, and so then at that moment, the federal government enters the, the housing, the realm of housing because you have the Great Depression. And one of the policy um, revenues for this um, global economic collapse that the Roosevelt administration came up with was let's shore up home ownership. Like if everyone has a stable place to live and has a chance to own their own home, won't that do a lot for, for the economy? Good, you know, seems like a very logical idea. And it's, it's so the, the federal government said, let's pump, let, let's give lots of money to banks um, that will allow them to underwrite mortgages. And this is the moment that you have the, the invention of the modern mortgage, the, the 15 and the 30 year mortgage for the first time. Um, but in order to do that, they said, we have to make sure that we only, um, you know, we only make good investments. Let's just, let's, let's, Let's develop an underwriting manual that will tell us where it's safe to invest and where it's not safe to invest. And that's where you have the redlining maps. That's where the redlining maps come in. So that was a group of um, bankers and real estate folks and policy people who went together and said, these neighborhoods are not safe. These neighborhoods are great. To get the top rating for, 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 for this kind of investment, you had to have racial covenants in place. But if you had any people who are not white in your neighborhood, then you got the lowest rating. That was those were the red those were the red line neighborhoods. So you had the green lining, which required racial covenants, and then you had the red lining, which was any place that didn't have people who are not white. But because this was decades later after covenants started, two decades. The reason, yeah. the reason yeah. you had black people concentrated in an yeah. area was because of the covenants. Exactly. So right. the covenants started. Yeah people redistributed and then the redlining was easy at that point. Yep. Yep. It would have been impossible without covenants. 
you know, would it, it would have been impossible if everyone's all intermingled, then you can't say one neighborhood is, is, is hazardous or, or you, you can't use race to say one neighborhood is good or, you know, maybe you say, oh, it's close to the railroad tracks or there's a tannery there or whatever, you know, yeah. you have something else, um, but it's not race. But because of the covenants, it allows, it creates an opener for race. And then if you live in one of those red line neighborhoods, um, which is the only place you can live if you're not white in Minneapolis, you cannot get conventional um, funding or financing for any property or any business. So it's not only, yeah. it's not yeah. only buying a house, it's maybe you want to start a business or maybe you want to use your house to leverage a business, you know? So it's, mm -hmm. it just has this, this, um, you know, this compound effect in terms of wealth right. um, accumulation. Can't get the bank loan. Uh, by yeah. the way, as a side note, I don't know if you know this, Kirsten, but uh, it, total coincidence, I could have taken credit for this planning, but not. Um, TPT did a documentary about this a few years ago called Jim Crow of the North. And, and to, to Kirsten's <laughs> point about this, you know, racial covenants and redlining were tools in the toolbox and Jim Crow of the North really does a good job of saying here's the whole toolbox in effect and that's actually being rebroadcast tonight on TPT2 mm -hmm. um, so you after you're done with this event here today um, check that out tonight you're in it so that's the that's that's uh, that's yeah. the spoiler as well um, as well so check out that documentary here's a question from the audience which I think is you know it's one of those basic questions that actually will help us recenter yeah. this are racial covenants that exist on housing today invalid yes they yes are. they are yeah so they are they have been rendered um unenforceable by a series of not just one thing so um you have shelley versus kramer in 1948 which was the supreme court decision that said okay racial covenants are are unenforceable you can't use the court system to enforce them um unfortunately you know th that was hailed as a huge victory for civil rights activists um, but what, what became immediately apparent is that that was not enough, that developers kept putting racial covenants in, kind of hoping that they would still keep, you know, they might not be able to take them to court, but they were still hoping that they would have a power. Um, and so then you have um, states like Minnesota. Minnesota was one of the first states to send, then pass additional legis state legislation to make it illegal to put new racial, you, you couldn't put new racial covenants in in 1955, but old racial covenants were still fine in Minnesota in 1955. And then in 1962, um, Minnesota passed one of the first Fair Housing Acts in the country, um, which was a precursor for the Federal Fair Housing Act, which made racial covenants, redlining, real estate steering, all forms of discrimination in the realm of real estate illegal. Um, so, and, and I guess in the legal terms, I guess one of the arguments was, the reason a city can't do this, a city can't say this because of constitutional protections, but a racial covenant is exists exists inside a private contract. When you sell a house, that's a private contract between one party and another. Yeah. Do I have that right? That that is yeah. basically the reason why these were held legal for so long. Yeah, it's a private contract, and they replaced. I want to say too, um, there's a there's a relationship. Some cities. Um, early in the 20th century, tried to do the same work through zoning. They had racial zoning, which was made, the Supreme Court rendered it illegal in 1917, um, not because it was a bad thing in their eyes, but because, well, they thought it was a bad thing because it, um, it, uh, it constrained the property rights of someone who was trying to, who prevented them from selling for, to whomever. It wasn't that, oh, this is a, violation of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution was, was a property yeah. rights violation. So when you hear all of this, or, or you look at all this work, there's a, there's a lot of, this still seeps into public policy debates, yeah. that the reason people live where they live is because of self-segregation. Oh, yeah. totally. We choose, we all, we all clump ourselves together by race or some other measurement, but usually race. Um, is that true? Well, I mean, I think people, yeah. So um, yes, people people choose, make choices about where they're gonna live, <laughs> but that's different from being not allowed to live places. Um, that there's a difference there. Um, you know, there's, there's something, um, I don't wanna invalidate the fact that people choose to be um, 
in close proximity to family and to friends and to social networks and to churches and to synagogues and to you know the institutions um, that are important to them. That's that's real, but that's different from not being allowed to live in large swaths of um, you know of, of our community. Um, and and so I hear that that. The reason we have this segregation is because it's just a it's just a personal choice. That is just not true. And and you can you know look at read these racial covenants. I will say don't don't listen to me. Just read one of these documents yourself and tell me if you're unclear about what the intention of this document is. Um, we yeah when we think of the history of of Minneapolis as one of to the point, black people and earlier, especially in the history of Minneapolis, Jewish people mm -hmm. were often found um, concentrated in North Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Is that related then to covenants? Yeah, yes. I mean, that is one of the, I mean, that's not the only place that black and Jewish people lived in. I always want to make that really clear. Um, if you look again, if you look at the data, you, you, you show, you know, you see um, the old South side is a super important neighborhood that I think a lot of people forget about. Um, and I mean, it's, it has the, all, the additional value in my mind of being, you can walk up fourth Avenue today and you can see the buildings that were these really important institutions in, um, you know, in, in civic life, everything from the spokesman recorder to the Nakarema club and, um, the, the site of the dreamland cafe where, um, AB Cassius, um, first, you know, first created space for people to do um, uh, civil rights, you know, sort of strategic meetings in, in you know, over coffee. So, um, so yeah, so it's, it's not, um, it's, that is part of why these neighborhoods took shape in the, in the way they, they, they did. Yes. So let's talk, I mean, we talked a lot about Minneapolis, but this was all, this was happening arguably per capita more in the suburbs as suburbs yeah. were created yeah. from whole yeah. cloth, they were yeah. created to be yeah. cities of covenants. Um, what are some examples that, that stand out for you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, a picture is worth a thousand words in this case, go to my, go to the website, um, our website, www.mappingprejudice.org. You put it up already. Thank you. Um, and check out, especially the, um, the western border of Minneapolis, I think, is one of the most fascinating um, places on the map because you can see, especially on the border of North Minneapolis, you can see how there's just this wall of covenants in Golden Valley, in Robbinsdale, um, and and then in St. Louis Park. Um, so, and I think St. Louis Park is one of the most interesting, um, you know, places to talk about in the way racial covenants maybe functioned in ways that people haven't fully recognized. Say more about that. Okay. So, um, so people, people always, you know, so when I was starting this work, people would say, um, they would say, well, okay, so here's the narrative that, um, that, you know, that blacks and Jews lived on the, on the North side. Um, but Jews were really, you know, Minneapolis was one of the most anti-Semitic places in the country. Um, there was, it was named the anti-Semitism capital of, um, of the United States in the, in the, in the 1940s. Um, so as a result of this, Jews left Minneapolis and went to St. Louis Park where they, you know, where it was more racially welcoming and, um, and, you know, and that's the story of why St. Louis Park is the vibrant, interesting place that it is today. Um, so the only problem with this narrative is that when you start mapping racial covenants, you see that St. Louis Park um, compared to most other communities in, in the metro area has more racial covenants per capita than, than almost anywhere else. It's blanketed by racial covenants. So this whole um, narrative that people have been telling for years that, that um, the reason that, that St. Louis Park became such a magnet was because it was free from these structural, <laughs> structural barriers is just, is just not true. Um, so it's also interesting it has a large jewish population and at one point jews were part of covenants very briefly as i understand i mean it, it became yeah. illegal to discriminate on the basis of religion before it did on race but right. i have that right right at one yep. point jews were part of covenants as yep. well yep in 19 and then in 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 response actually to an ad that was published in the minneapolis journal by by the the edmund walton he was the developer who brought covenants to the twin cities um 
uh, the Jewish community organized um, in response to this, the text of this ad, which um, named all these different groups that were um, going to be barred from Walton's um, subdivision that he was advertising. And they got a they got a law passed in the legislature making it illegal to to um, discriminate on the basis of religion. So so that's so that happens, and um, it doesn't mean that discrimination didn't continue on on the basis of anti-Semitism. Um, it's just that it wasn't through the text of covenants in the way that people remember. So the, to the question earlier, though, Kirsten, these aren't valid anymore. They right. they don't have the force of law. Yeah. So I guess one way to ask this is then so so what? Who cares? Who cares? Yeah, who cares? That's a great question. Um, and the answer is that we have found that they continue to cast a long shadow. Everything from, I mean, you wouldn't believe necessarily these prop the property value difference, right? Between um, and when the economists that we have been working with presented that data at the Federal Reserve downtown. We had these economists from all over the country. They could not believe it. They were absolutely incredulous that they, they were like, that number is way too big. That's not possible that you could have that kind of number. Um, so, so that's just one example. Another example is um, the fact that the areas that have racial that had racial covenants are still the whitest areas of the Twin Cities today. So these so these development patterns, once they're in place, were just very persistent. Um, covenants were incredibly um, powerful in the Twin Cities. And, and then once, um, once racial covenants were um, made illegal, um, it was right at that moment that in Minneapolis, at least, um, single family zoning was put into place right at the same moment that racial covenants were made illegal. So then the development patterns that had been established by racial covenants were locked in by these new zoning laws that again, um, made it much more expensive to, you know, made the property in those neighborhoods um, more expensive. You, you couldn't build a multifamily, you couldn't build a duplex, for instance, um, where, you know, one part of a family could live in one side and the other, you know, like there's all kinds of ways that um, people, you know, find ways to make housing more affordable. All that's off limits then. Um, so, th so those, and then the neighborhoods that where people who are not white were able to buy um, houses like the old South side, the near North side, Cedar River side. Those are the areas that were targeted by freeway construction. So most of those neighborhoods were actually demolished um, by the new freeways that went in in the 1960s. So all those, and people did not get um, the, you know, the full value of those properties. Um, so then they were, so, so all these things, and, and you don't just restart the clock. I mean, my own family experience is that, and, and realtors have actually done a great job of documenting this, um, is that most people who buy a house get some help from family in, in some way or another. It doesn't mean, you know, there's gonna be people out there who are saying, well, I didn't get any help from family, but maybe you didn't have student loans. You know, maybe your family helped you in some other way, or maybe you lived at home because you had a house um, and you could get through college without, you know, without paying rent, you know, like there's all kinds of ways that these things compound. Um, and once, once, once a pattern is locked into place, it's a lot harder to displace it. And it's not enough just to say, okay, that bad thing that you've been doing all these years, just stop doing that. Okay. And now we're good. Right. Right. And so then it's now you're good. So black people, you can go buy a house anywhere you want, yeah. Oh, yeah. but, but, but that's not as easy because there's decades of inability to pass on wealth the way your grandma did to you so that you could buy your house maybe you maybe you got your deposit from that mm -hmm. maybe you were able to put down right. your deposit because of that and there are black families who just don't have that capital anymore because they never did right and i had a lot of you know I, not only did i get help you know down payment help but i also got a lot of help you know getting through school you know so i mean there's there's a lot of ways that you end up, uh, you know, ahead when your family has more stability and more financial depth, you know. Um, so, so what? So we now this is a public policy organization, and so yeah. we always want to know, like, what are the policy debates and conversations yeah. that racial covenants should be a part of 
yeah. part of me wonders if the question should be what policy debates should they not be part of because that may be a shorter answer but but yeah. but just yeah. give it give it a whirl on yeah. where does this history sh where should that be coming in in our city councils and in our state houses and 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 planning commissions and all of that yeah i can't think of any place that's not relevant <laughs> so whenever um whenever anyone says okay so what's the one thing we have to do yeah. to reverse this i'm like well it's sorry that, that's not and again like um i want to um, as we were, we were doing, we were chatting a little before we went live here, and um, I was reiterating the fact that Mapping Prejudice has had power and success as a project because we've been in conversation with community. I'm not here to tell people, you know, everything that should be done, because you all are doing that. You know, that's that's why I do these conversations. I'm here as you a truth teller. <laughs> you thought this would be a six month project, right? Yeah, I thought it would. I thought we we're going to show a map, start some conversations, you know, and I would, you know, explain a little known facet of, of Minneapolis history. Um, I, you know, so I, and I also know a couple of things about policy. I know that when you're looking for policy remedies, you need to talk to the people who are most affected by the problem. I, I, on the other hand, have benefited from these practices. So I am not the person. You know, so I'm not I'm not trying to dodge this at yeah. all. I'm just saying I'm just yeah. trying to create a, my own make my own position clear here in terms of I'm not here to tell you I'm here as a truth teller. I'm here to hold the the, the community accountable and tell you know and tell and and also tell people tell all of you that you all have a role to play <laughs> that this is not in any one thing. But I would point people to a couple of things. One, um, I think one place that the question of covenants is particularly relevant is around um, the new tenant protection um, uh, laws that are being, or regulations that are being debated. I mean, the reason that the vast majority, the, the reason why tenant protections is a racial equity issue is because of this history. Um, because, you know, because Covenants created the largest racial um, home ownership gap in the country. That's what we have in the Twin Cities. So that means that if you're, you know, if you're a white person, you know, 70, 75%, 76% of white families own their own homes, 23% of black families own their own homes. And so that means that those, that other 75% are renters. And we all know that it's a very different, you have a very different level of control of your environment, of your costs, of everything, if you're a renter. And so so what are we doing in terms of public policy remedies, you know, not just to help people move from being renters to homeowners, but also protecting people who are in, you know, who are vulnerable. So that's one thing that I would that I would offer. There was a law passed because of your project a few years ago at the state level that says if you have one of these covenants, even if you have this language in your deed, even though it's not enforceable, now here's a way to get rid of it, <laughs> get yeah. it erased. Yeah. Um, and that, and from that, as I understand, it looks like has spurned uh, a new project called Just Deeds, mm -hmm. Just Deeds. Yeah. Um, and I believe there's now 11 cities. St. Louis Park, I think, is coming, but Golden Valley, Robbinsdale, New Hope, Crystal Minnetonka, Minneapolis, Hopkins, Rochester, Richfield, and then Edina and St. Louis Park are coming. What is Just Deeds? Just Deeds is this group of amazing people who came to me last summer and they had already been working and organizing as people who are in municipal government, planners, real estate, title, um, the um, there's a title company involved. Um, and they are all people who are on the front, the front lines, I would say, in dealing with all the fallout, all the, the fallout of these historic practices and who are determined um, to take action and wanted to be working in coalition with other people who, who want to figure out what we need to do today. Um, so one, their, their sort of immediate point of service was to serve as pro bono legal advisors for anyone who wants to take advantage of this law that makes it possible to do what's called discharge the deeds. You know, so that, that so if you have a covenant in your property, you can, um, you can go to Just Deeds and they will help, they'll walk you through the process of how to discharge it, how to get rid of it. Um, but then they, you know, but then it's, we want to make it clear, anyone who's involved in Just Deeds, that that's not enough, right? That that's your moment to say, okay, I have a personal connection to this history. What, what other obligation does that put on me to, you know, whether it's, um, as my colleague Maria Cisneros, um, who's a plan, who's a, the city attorney for Golden Valley, who's one of the 
um, leaders of this coalition says, you know, if if I get seven people at a planning commission meeting, that's huge. <laughs> like you never underestimate your voice and your power. Um, you know, as a thoughtful, committed individual, how the impact that you can have um, in in you know in as a power for good, um, yeah. especially with a consciousness of this history. So it's a and it's it's a really it sounds like it's a really if you live in one of those cities, it's a very streamlined way to to get that help and a look up to see if you have the covenant and then get rid of it and then to your point go from there uh, anyone when, anyone in the state of minnesota can can call on just deeds you don't have to oh, very good those. yeah yeah there we go that's just partner cities who are working yeah, with them exactly so um one more question here online uh because you're talking about these single family housing, for example, was a zoning choice. Minneapolis actually did pass a big plan a, a year or so ago, for example, gets rid of that kind of zoning. And the city council members all indicated that it was trying to change, erase, change some of those um, ills and, and, and discrimination, discriminatory practices from the, from the past. So is the opposition, the question here online goes to that, um, a residue of these racial covenants. What are your thoughts on that? The, the, the debate we had in Minneapolis about that plan. Well, I definitely heard. I mean, I, I want to. I don't want to oversimplify that because I, <laughs> I, I hate that when people, um, you know, go immediately to that place of assuming that anyone who has a different view from you is um, malicious or racist, and that's not certainly not my sense. Um, but there are definitely people who I heard in those debates over 2040 who said, um, we like our neighborhoods just the way they are. And, 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 and race was a big piece of that. And people, you know, if you're not living in this neighborhood, it's because you didn't work hard enough and you didn't get a, you know, you didn't put time into your education and, and you don't deserve to be here. So I think that's a really, I mean, I hope that this history will help people understand why that's not true. And, um, you know, and I hope, I hope that, I think, I hope that people can, I hope that mapping prejudice helps people see the racism behind the racial disparities. That this is not, that was deliberately manufactured. There's nothing accidental about this. And that understanding that intentionality, I would hope would, would, um, provoke a different level of commitment from people to find solutions. And, and they're gonna be multifaceted you know, solutions. So, so again, like the 2040 plan is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, it doesn't mean, it doesn't require um, developers to set aside a certain number of affordable apartments, for instance. You know, if they build a lot of units on one parcel of land, it still doesn't solve our housing crisis. That we're, that we're in, but it, you know, it's, it, it allows, you know, it allows for some new solutions is the way I would describe it. Well, we're at the end of our hour and I really yeah. want to thank you all for joining us and for you, uh, Kirsten, for being here. I, I, if you go to the Mapping Prejudice page, uh, is that something people can support? Uh, is oh, that something? Oh gosh, we would love that. <laughs> <laughs> I assume so, because yes, yes. I'm going to do a plug for Citizens League in a moment, so go yeah. for it on Mapping Prejudice. Yeah, but I mean, the most way you can support it is by being, doing what Citizens League does, is being engaged in your, you know, that, that's what we're looking for here. That's the main way um, you can support the work of Mapping Prejudice. Well, and thank you for everyone who does support the Citizens League. Check out citizensleague.org for more events. And yes, maybe send a donation. Um, there is an interconnected series on rural urban um, policies that's coming up. There's an event here you can see on the screen here, June 3rd, and a bunch of other events coming up. So if you go to citizensleague.org slash events, you can see that this isn't the only thing we're doing here, just this event today. There's a lot, Citizens League is very active and and doing a lot of uh, a lot of opening of minds, I guess you could say as well. So Kirsten uh, Delegard from Mapping Prejudice, thank you so much for your time and thank you everybody um, for watching this hour. Thank you so much.